Hey, did you know that GraphQL killed the REST API? Well, that can't be true because TRPC is so popular and that's just a REST API. TRPC isn't a REST API. Everyone knows under the hood it uses gRPC. Okay, boy, settle down. You're all wrong. I think we need to have a little chat about the different types of APIs there are. So I'm going to take you through the three different types of APIs. REST APIs, RPC, and of course, GraphQL. So there's probably other types of APIs that I'm not aware of, and I don't want to see you keyboard warriors in the comment section below telling me about some API technology that your dad used pre nam Hey, it's Editing Tom here, and before we jump into the video, I just want to make it clear what it is that I'm talking about exactly when I say API. So I like to think of my applications in terms of layers. So down the bottom here, we're going to have our database, and then to interact with our database, we might use something like Prisma. And when we go to use Prisma, we're using Prisma through its API. And this is not the API that I'm talking about. On top of Prisma, we may have a services layer. And then on top of our services layer, we're going to have some controllers. And these controllers are going to house our business logic. So our services layer is also going to have an API that our controller layer is going to interact with. But again, this is not the API that I'm talking about. The API that I am talking about is our top layer here. So this is going to be our API, and this is the layer that our network is going to interact with. So let's say that we had a client over here. Our client is going to interact with our API layer at the top of our stack here. And this specifically is the layer that I'm talking about in this video. So let's jump back into the rest of the video. So let's start off by going through what a REST API is. So REST stands for Representational State Transfer. So a REST API leverages the HTTP protocol and everything is based around resources. So we perform methods on resources. And typically the sorts of actions that you're going to be performing are CRUD operations, which is creating, reading, updating, and deleting. And then we have HTTP methods that correlate to these actions. So if you want to create a record in a REST API, you're typically going to use a POST request, and this is to create. If you're going to read a record, you're going to make a GET request, and then this is to read. If you're going to update, you're going to use either a PUT or a PATCH. And this is to update. And then finally, to delete a record, of course, you're going to be using a DELETE method. So we perform these methods on resources. So you might see a URL that is something like slash API slash V1 slash products slash, and then we have our product ID here. So the API is just to say that this is a REST API endpoint. The version is the version of the API endpoint. And then products is the resource that we're going to create in this case. And the resources are always plural. So if we're going to get a list of all products, we're going to have the same sort of endpoint here but we're going to remove the product ID and our endpoint is going to be slash products. If we were to read a single product, we're still going to have slash products because this is the type of resource that we're going to read. And again, we're just going to use the product ID here. And then if we were to update a record via a put request, it would be exactly the same as our post request and then same for delete here. So one of the main benefits of REST APIs is that they're really predictable. You can see here what method we're going to be performing and then what resource we're going to be performing that method on. This makes them really good for integrations with third parties. So if your application needs to provide a public API, a REST API is probably a good option for that. The other benefit of REST APIs is that the tooling is extremely mature. There's tons of resources on how to learn this stuff and how to build these things as well. They're also extremely simple to build. So if you're going to build a small application, a REST API is typically a good way to go. One of the big downfalls of a REST API is that they're centered around resources, where not all of the actions that you want to perform via an API are going to be centered around a resource. 
Let's say login, for example. Login is an action. What are we actually creating there? You could say we're creating a session and you could have your endpoint as slash sessions and then you can make a post request. But really, the action is login. When designed correctly, we wouldn't have actions in the URL for a REST API. Most people just ignore this and have a few actions in their endpoints. Another increasingly popular way to make an API is RPC, which stands for Remote Procedural Call. So there's two really popular implementations of RPC, and they are of course gRPC, invented at Google, and used for system-to-system -system communication technically. And then there's also tRPC. tRPC is a TypeScript implementation of the RPC. So where REST APIs are centered around resources, RPC is centered around actions. It's actions that you can perform on a remote system. gRPC and tRPC are of course two very separate technologies. The ideas around them are fairly similar, but they are two different technologies and they should not be confused for one or the other. You may be wondering, if you've used tRPC, especially if you've used Create T3 app, you might be saying, well, where's the remote part of this? Everything I'm building is all in one application. So the remote part of this is your client performing an action on your server, which when deployed is a remote server. So let's draw up a little example of what an RPC system might look like. So let's say we have products here, and then we also have an ordering system. And let's say that our product server here is a PHP server, and our orders is a C++ server, for example. When we make an order, we want to tell our product server, hey, increment the sold amount for this given product by one. So on our product server here, we might have an action that says inc by one. So this is a function, and let's say it's exposed in gRPC. We can now call this function from this remote system here of orders. So let's say we have a tRPC application here, and we're going to have our client. And then we also have our backend. And the lines between these, because they do run in a monorepo, are often quite blurred, but the lines do exist there. So our client can now perform queries, which are just function calls on the back end. And they can also perform mutations, which again, are just function calls. So the benefits of using RPC aren't universal between tRPC and say gRPC. gRPC is typically very fast and used for system to system calls. tRPC on the other hand gives you type type safety, which is a mouthful to say. In my opinion, tRPC is also very forgiving in terms of how you structure your application. So if there's a little bit of inconsistency there, it's still going to be extremely easy for someone to pick the application up and understand what's going on. I do like to structure my procedures via an action name. So for example, if you wanted to get a list of products, you would call the procedure get products. Whereas in a REST API, you would just have slash API slash products. You would not have a endpoint here that is slash get products. That wouldn't be very RESTful. If you're going to create a product, again, I would have the action and then I would have the resource that you're performing that action on. So I would say create, and then we can create a single product here. The takeaway here is that tRPC and gRPC are two distinct technologies, but they do implement the RPC style of API. So the third style of API that I want to talk about is, of course, GraphQL. So if REST APIs are all about resources and RPC is all about actions, GraphQL is all about serving a graph of data. The GraphQL APIs are really good when you have a complicated schema and you have distinct relationships between the nodes in this schema. So what do I mean when I say a graph? A graph is made up by nodes, and then between those nodes, we have edges. So let's say we have this one node here, and this is going to be our products. And then we have another node, and then this is going to be our orders. We can have an edge between these, and this is going to be the relationship between orders and products. So a order is going to have many products and a product is going to have many orders. Now we might also have another node here, and this can be our users, and our user is going to have many orders, but they also might have products in the way of recommended products, for example. So now that we've exposed this over a graph, we can make a query that looks something like this. So we can say, give me all the users, 
And I also want to join on all the, the products. And from the product, I want to get the name and I also want to get the ID. Now we don't have to specify this query in our backend. All we have to do is specify how to resolve a user's products. So GraphQL is extremely useful if you have a distinct backend and frontend team. The reason is, is the backend team doesn't have to anticipate what resources are going to be needed and how to expose those resources. So that means that the client can define how they want to query the data and they're only ever gonna get back the payload that they define in that query. It's also really useful in that you don't have to version your API, you can simply deprecate fields. So let's say products no longer have an ID, they now have an underscore ID. We can just deprecate this ID field here and then when we're safe to do so, we can remove it later, but you don't really ever have to use it. You're gonna say that this is deprecated, you should now use the underscore ID and you don't need to version this schema, you can just let it evolve over time. GraphQL comes with some pretty big downfalls as well. The first criticism is that it's really complicated. It's complicated to implement and it's complicated to resolve these queries. So these queries in theory can get infinitely deep depending on your implementation. So they can be expensive to resolve in the backend if you need to query a lot of nodes to get down deep into the query. Another big mistake that I see with GraphQL APIs is people using them as if they're a REST API or even an RPC API. So if your data is not connected in a graph and you can't traverse here from say users to orders to products, then you haven't actually exposed a graph and you would have been better off using a REST API or even an RPC API. A really big tell for this is when you see queries that are named after actions. So let's say we had a query called get users. You can probably tell that this get users has probably been designed for a specific page, which goes against the philosophy of GraphQL. You should just be exposing a graph and then when you get to the client, you can figure out how to use that graph. Another big tell is if you can't traverse from one node in your application to another, so you have islands of resources. You probably haven't implemented your GraphQL API as a graph and therefore you are absorbing a lot of the complexity that comes with GraphQL without getting any of the benefit. So they're the main three ways to make APIs. So if you enjoyed this video and you found it helpful, please make sure you leave a thumbs up and let me know in the comment section below what sort of API is your favorite to build. Thank you for watching and I'll see you in the next video.